All right, all right, all right. Welcome everybody to Metaphysical Bible Study. It's Julian Gordon here. Excited to have you. Uh, we're continuing our journey through Genesis. Um, we actually went uh, from Genesis 12 all the way to 18 and 19 last week, which was the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, we started to see uh, some deep insights and understandings about that story and how it actually is an allegory that speaks to our fight, flight, and freeze uh, an automatic or not autonomic response system, excuse me, um, our central nervous system. And so uh, thus far as we go through Genesis, as we know, Genesis, genes, right? Genes is the core word of Genesis. Uh, we know that um, uh, we've been able to map many things to parts of the body. We've been able to map many of the stories to various parts of the body, which is very interesting, especially when Christians use the language, the body of Christ, right? Um, your body is a temple. Um, we are starting to see some deep insights in terms of not only the physical body, but also the mind. Uh, we've been able to break down some of the stories and understand how the fowls and the birds represent our superconscious thoughts, the cattle and the animals that are on the surface or the earth, which is a conscious mind, represent our conscious thoughts, and the fish represent our subconscious thoughts. And so uh, we're, we're really breaking through and uncovering some things. And so we skipped from Genesis 12 to 18 and 19 because I thought that uh, 13 through 17 didn't have as much allegorical stories. There's no particular story in uh, Genesis 13 through 17. So I said, let's just go to the next story that has a beginning and an end, which was Sodom and Gomorrah. And um, after going back in my own study, <coughs> excuse me, and seeing uh, and rereading 13 and seven through 17, I was like, uh-oh, we got to go back. We can't skip this, all right? Um, and so uh, last week's homework was to read and decode Genesis 13 through 15. Um, in chat, uh, please let me know if you were able to do that. Please let me know if you were able to do that. Um, here, uh, we engage in active spirituality, not passive spirituality. Passive spirituality is when you simply just go show up um, at a church or some sort of spiritual center and you let the minister um, do all of the work, right? They spend their week studying and practicing, studying to show themselves approved, and then you come get the cliff notes. Uh, that is for babies, okay? It is time for us to spiritually mature and get off the baby food, and it's time for us to get into meat. And I'm not talking about physical flesh meat, okay? I'm talking about the truth, the deeper truths that exist, all right? So um, as I said before, and you saw it on my Instagram post, the one thing that we should never outsource is our spirituality. The one thing that we should never outsource is our spirituality. You can outsource your gardening. You can outsource your oil change. You can outsource your car wash. You can outsource your dental work, right? You can outsource your house cleaning, outsource all the things that are not important to you. But the one thing that we should never outsource is our spirituality. We don't have to get our spirituality through a middle man or a middle woman. We can go directly to the mother, father, God, and that is the most powerful connection. Have you ever bought a, uh, uh, a cell phone charger uh, off market? You didn't get it from Samsung. You didn't get it from Apple. And it just didn't charge the phone the same. How many of you had that experience before? Where you bought an off market cell phone charger. You just needed something real quick, right? To get charged up. And you bought one that didn't come from the Apple store. didn't come from Samsung, et cetera. And that particular connection, in fact, this is... This is an authentic Apple one. Even the other ones will look like it, right? They'll even make the other ones look like it, but you can tell it's not it because it does not charge the phone or the tablet or the computer in the same way, right? Because they didn't go directly through the man manufacturer. Well, our man manufacturer is God. And you don't have to go through another manufacturer to get and plug in to what you need. All right. And so this is what this practice is really all about. Uh, I'm not here to convince or convert you uh, on terms of the divine downloads that I'm getting and receiving from reading these texts. All I'm hoping and praying for you is that you stay disciplined in your own spiritual journey. That's it. Not here to convince or convert. But I know that as you go through this process, as we engage in this process together through metaphysical Bible study, consistently reading these allegorical stories and decoding them and asking sincerely, for deeper insights, um, and it says, ask and you shall find, right? The truth will set you free. Seeking you shall find, right? So this is what we're engaged in. And so um, 
we're going to get into the scripture in just a second. Uh, we have some uh, opening. Um, I hate to call them rituals because I don't want this space to be about dogma whatsoever. But we do want to connect to the source, whatever you call it, however you define it. Um, typically, the way we do that is we uh, do a meditation, um, a, uh, which is just simply five deep breaths in and out. And then because we know that breath is the way that the source um, is, we know that we're being breath, breathe through. OK, if we don't control our breathing. We're being, we're being breathed through. Only way we can stop our breathing is if we commit suicide. Right. So um, there's something breathing through us like an instrument. Right. And I hope that your life is making a sweet, sweet sound as a result of that. Then um, they, from there, we read our affirmation that just gets us grounded in terms of why we're doing this work. So we're going to go there right now. We're going to go there right now and um, do that you know, for. So let me get to. Meditation. All right. So um, simply what we're going to do is we're going to in heaven. We're going to in heaven. We're going to take heaven in. OK, oxygen. We're going to take it in. Um, we're going to hold it for, we're going to take in for four, hold for one, and release for five, okay? So let's just do five deep breaths together, all okay? right? Okay, in heaven, hold, release. In heaven and exhale, number two. In heaven, four seconds. Hold, release. Okay, number three, in heaven. Hold, release. more in heaven. Hold, release. Last one, fill your lungs in heaven. Hold, release. Whenever you feel disconnected from your source, you can always go back to your breath. You don't have to go to any spiritual place. You don't have to go into any book. You can simply go back to your breath. You're breathing all the time or something is breathing through you all the time. But we get so caught up in the busyness of this material world and experience that we don't take a moment to just honor the breath. Knowing that if the breath stopped, this entire material experience would stop. And so you can always go back to your breath if you ever feel disconnected, right? So with that, um, we're going to, I'm going to share the Truth Seekers Prayer, and then we're going to get into Genesis 13. Don't want to take too long with the intro. I want to get straight into the meat, all right? So I'm going to share the Truth Seekers Prayer um, on Zoom. If you haven't seen it already uh, on Zoom, when I share it on Zoom, family, uh, I encourage you to uh, take a screenshot so that you have it with you. Um, so whenever you're doing your own study, uh, you can anchor yourself with the Truth Seekers Prayer. This was divinely inspired um, as I was being, as the seed to start this space was planted in me. And um, so I'm here to share it with you, okay? It's called the Truth Seekers Prayer. Again, for those of you who are on social media or other platforms, um, this is what it looks like, and uh, this is what I'm reading from. And you can, again, join us on Zoom at jointruthseekers.com. Again, that's jointruthseekers.com, all right? So we are truth seekers. We seek the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We know that the truth shall set us free, John 8, 32. We believe that when we ask, it shall be given to us. When we seek, we shall find. And when we knock, the door shall be opened unto us, Matthew 7, 7. We know that as we sit in the temple of our mind, listening for your voice and asking questions in that holy place, we shall find understanding and answers. Luke 2, 46 through 47. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. 
Luke 12, 2. We know that because the Bible is heavily coded in allegories, Galatians 4, 24, similes, Luke 13, 18, and parables, Matthew 13, 34, many who think they are seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand, including those who call themselves your disciples, Matthew 13, 13. We know not to rely on the letter, but the spirit of the word, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. We are meant to study to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Wash our feet, which represents our understanding, so that we may build our church or temple, which is our individual belief system, upon a rock of truth that we are the sons and daughters of God, Matthew 16.16. 16. May we feel free to renew our minds, Romans 12.2, by destroying and rebuilding our temple over and over and get better and better leaving no stone standing, Matthew 24, 2. We know that when we pray, we shall enter into the closet of our mind, shut the door, and pray to God, which is in secret, Matthew 6, 6. And we also know that where two or three are gathered together in your name, I am, is in the midst of them, Matthew 18, 20. We pray this metaphysical Bible study blesses, builds, and brings all children of God closer to you, whether inside or outside of a religious context, even if that means wrestling with our concept of you for our blessing like Jacob in Genesis 32. We love you and thank you with all of our hearts, minds, and souls. Matthew 22, 37, Ashe, amen. And so it is. All right. So that is the true secrets prayer. Um, and uh, I just want to actually, I want to stay there really quickly. And this is, this is where you see, this is how you know um, the religious system has taken many of the uh, texts in the Bible literally when they weren't meant to be. When you go pray at a Catholic church, where do they where do they tell you to go pray? When you go pray at a Catholic church, where do they tell you to go pray? What do they tell you to go pray in a Catholic church? They put you in a closet. They literally have a prayer closet. So they took Matthew, they took Matthew 6.6, 6, I believe. Matthew 6.6, 6, where it says, when we, when we know that when we pray, we shall enter in the closet of our mind, shut the door and pray to God, which is a secret. They literally just said, okay, that means we actually should be in a closet. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. Okay, so the Bible is heavily coded in allegories, but the religious system has taken many of the scriptures literally, right? And it actually has thrown us off in uh, off course in terms of uh, being in alignment or what we call atonement. If you break down the word atonement, what is it? At one mint. Atonement means at one mint or in alignment with God. You are one with God. I and the Father are one. That's what atonement means, is that we are one with our source. Just like a drop, if you go into the ocean and you take a drop of water from the ocean, that drop has everything that the entire ocean has in it. Every single ingredient is in that drop that is in the larger body of water. The only difference between that drop and the ocean itself is magnitude. The only difference between that drop and the ocean is magnitude. In the same way, the only difference between you and God is magnitude. John 10, 34 says, is it not written in your law? I have said, ye are gods, lowercase g. There's only one OG with the capital G, but we are lowercase gods as little g's, as children of God, all right? So let's get into it. <coughs> um, we're going into Genesis 13, uh, 14, and 15 today. Normally, we only read one chapter, but uh, we're trying to do some catch up to fill in a gap as we jump from Genesis 12 all the way to 18, 19, which was Sodom and Gomorrah, and me recognizing that 13 through 17 have a lot of richness as I went back and studied them on my own. And so we're going backwards a little bit. And so we're trying to catch up to get us back up to Genesis 20. All right. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Okay. Let's get it in. So here on Zoom, I'm reading line by line through my, my notes and uh, what I've discovered. 
But again, um, this journey is for everyone to have their own discoveries and divine downloads. All right. So chapter 13, and Abram went up, to, uh, went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. So we know that lot represents our body consciousness. Lot means veil or covering, right? And Egypt is also uh, the place of body consciousness or the root chakra. This is where you root chakra is red. This is where you get red sea, right? All of these things. Adam uh, or Adama means uh, red man. So we see this matching of colors with the chakra system. And we're going to get into Jacob's coat of many colors later on. All right. Um, or Joseph's coat of many colors, excuse me. Verse two, when Abram was very rich with cattle in silver and in gold. Okay. So um, Abram had come down to Egypt in the midst of famine. So Abram came down with Sarai and Lot as substance, as substance, right? Not any particular substance. This universal e etheric universal matter this spiritual matter abram had come down right into egypt then we come into famine because now this spiritual essence is coming into the body consciousness the spirit that never hungers spirit never hungers there's no digestive system in the spiritual realm but now as this spiritual realm which is our journey right from as spiritual beings having a human experience when we're coming into this earthly experience this material experience as spirit we're feeling hunger for the first time. And, and what, do, what is the number one reason babies cry? What is the number one reason babies cry? They cry because of hunger. They cry because of hunger. This spirit is now stepping into the body, taking, uh, starting to attune itself to a body and is experiencing hunger for the first time ever. Okay, so we saw that. Um, we saw that earlier with Abram's descend, descending down, okay, into Egypt. So uh, Abram was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. And um, so now Abram has actually came down as substance, but is now coming back up what? With materiality. The spirit has descended and is now ascending again with materiality. It's seeing if it can actually lift this material uh, materiality up. And that's what the gold, the silver, and the cattle represent, okay? And so meat and metals. And verse three, and he went on his journey, from the south, okay, again, you're going to see down, south, north, up, down, you're going to see that all throughout the scriptures, and this is just our spiritual journey, our vibrational journey, high frequency, low frequency, high frequency, low frequency, anytime, any place you are, you can ask yourself, am I on a high frequency or low frequency, and basically, highest frequency that we have here is what? The highest frequency on earth is what? Is heaven. Heaven on earth. That's the highest frequency. The lowest frequency on earth is what? Is hell on earth. Every single moment, we're either choosing heaven or hell. These are not physical locations that you go to after the body dies. Because if heaven or hell are physical locations, but the spirit is not a physical thing, that's where you know people are off. They've made heaven or hell physical locations but the body, the physical body stays here on earth and the spirit goes. If the spirit is not physical, the spirit is non-physical, why would it go to a physical location? Why would the spirit go to a physical location when it is a non-physical thing? Okay, so these are some of the lies that have been told and uh, told by religion and uh, we're here to demystify them so that we can walk in truth, okay? So the highest frequency that we can operate in here on earth is heaven on earth right? On earth as it is where? In heaven. So we're actually meant to have heaven here on earth, not sometime after, later on, okay? We're meant to have it here and now, all right? And so verse three, and he went up on, we, he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel. Now we here break down all of the words. In fact, we didn't do our, um, our quick analysis, excuse me. We skipped a step. We skipped a step. I'm sorry. We are meant to uh, break down our questions. Where's my template? Oh, here it is. We're meant to break down our questions. Um, so let me copy this page. Copy page. Paste page. All right. Um, sorry about that. I was so eager to get into the study that I skipped a step. Okay. Abram. And lot. All right. 
So before we go forward, who are the persons in who are the persons in Genesis 13 through 15? Who are the persons? We got Abram. We got Lot. We got Sarai. We got Canaanites. All the kings, several kings. Parasites, good. Places, we got Sodom. We got Beth El. Where else? Mamre again, Mamre Gland. We got Melchizedek. All right, Hebron, Zoar again, Egypt, Sidon. Okay, and then what things come up? We have gold, we have silver, we got cattle, tents, livestock, yep, cattle, livestock, flocks. 318 servants, altar, okay. Now, what questions came up and what things did not make sense? What questions came up and what things did not make sense in Genesis 13 through 15? Why did Abraham take, why did Abram take Lot? Why did Abram take Lot? Why is Lot, why is Lot drawn to Sodom again? Oh, well, why is Lot drawn to Sodom? Actually, we went forward. So we went to Sodom. Uh, that's how we got to Sodom, excuse me. Forgot we went out of order. <laughs> All right, what other questions came up? When things didn't make sense? What was the king's conflict? What was... What were these kings fighting about? It was not clear. Who the heck is, who the heaven is Melchizedek? I think I spelled that wrong. How did Abram know the tithe? Where did this custom come from? How did he know to tithe or why did he tithe? Why did God get upset about splitting of carcasses? Um, What does it mean that your offspring will number more than dust? What does that mean? How did, how did Abram travel all throughout all throughout this land. If I show you a map, you're gonna be like, what? Okay. Why not cut the bird? Why not split the birds? Why not split the birds? Okay. Good, 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 okay, good. So let's get back into it. All right, <clears throat> um, so Beth El means house of God or El, okay? And so what other word ends in El? People talk about there weren't any other gods, right? 
What other word ends in L? Is Ra L. Isis Ra L. Isis Ra L. Isis being the spirit, Ra being the sun god or sun, and L being the father. Is Ra L. Sam U L. <laughs> Okay, so L was a, uh, I believe a um, uh, Mesopotamian god, or a, uh, <laughs> I believe a Mesopotamian god. Okay, um, so you can see how religions, belief systems got blended. So unto places where the uh, where his tent had been at the beginning, between Beth El and Hai. So Hai is very close to the word chai, uh, chai or Chi, which means alive or living or energy. In verse four, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Um, verse five, and Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, all right? So we know that Lot means covering, to wrap closely, to en envelop or veil. We know that Abram means exalted father, all right? So just keep those in mind. Now, verse six, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so they could not dwell together, all right? And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Pezerite dwelled in the land, okay? And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. When we are brethren, what does that mean? That we come from what source? When we are brethren, it means that we come from what source, family? It means we come from one source. My brothers and I come from one source, right? So it's not that Abram or the spiritual essence of us is better than the body consciousness of us or the physical essence of us. They all come from one source. The physical material experience is just more dense. It's just more dense than the spiritual. But just because you can't see the spiritual with your eyes does not mean it's not present. In fact, it's even more present because if you truly know anatomy, an atom is more empty or more full? Is an atom empty or full? Is an atom empty or full? An atom is like 99% empty family. So this physical reality that we are experiencing in many ways is an illusion. None of this stuff is actually physical. None of it is firm. It can all be cut through. It's a perception that you hit something. When you, when you like hit a wall, you realize that you actually never touch the thing. If you go study physics, you never touch the wall. It is, but what you feel is the physical pushback of the resistance of the atoms and the ions as you approach that thing with force. It's like a video game. This is like a virtual reality experience. <laughs> I may look like I'm physical, but I can be pierced through. Meaning that there is, this is a poor, I'm a, I'm a porous thing. I have pores. We even say it, well, I have pores, right? I have holes in me. Just because they're microcosmic doesn't mean that they don't, that they're not there. So I look like a physical being and I look firm and I look solid, but I'm not, okay? And so what we're experiencing here, the land not being able to hold them both is two things at war, the body and the spirit. The flesh and the spirit are at war. There's strife. Is not the body and the spirit, is not the flesh and the spirit battling all the time? Your spirit and your mind say, I know I should be eating this, but your body says, I want this. Your spirit and your mind say, I want to start investing for the long term, but your body says, no, I want YOLO. I want it now. So this is the strife that is occurring right now. It's the strife between the I am, all capital, and the I am, the individual. The I am, the one, and the I am, me, the individual, the egoic individual, okay? And 
Abram, being the spiritual self, has taken the high road and saying, I know we can't dwell together. I would like to dwell together. You are my brethren. But right now at this stage, we cannot dwell together. So let us part ways. There's plenty for us. Okay? So this is the spirit and body. Uh, ultimately, we want the spirit and body to work as one. Right? Now, where do we see, what other stories do we see where brethren or brothers were at war with one another? Because the allegory runs through the entire Bible. What other stories do we see? We see Cain and Abel. We see Jacob and Esau. And we see Joseph and his brothers. Okay, now Joseph had the tw his 12 brothers, right? Or 11 brothers. I think it was Benjamin the 12. I think it was 11, all right? Um, 11 or 12. But in terms of two brothers, Cain and Abel and Jacob and Esau. The same thing. Because Esau represented what? Esau was hairy. Esau represented the physical side, the hunter. Jacob stayed in the house. What dwells in the house, family? What dwells in the house? Spirit dwells in the If the body is a temple, what dwells in the house? The spirit. So Joseph represents the spirit. Okay? So you're seeing these same patterns play out over and over and over again. And what we've seen already in Genesis is that the allegories and parables that Jesus tells are shorter, and many of them are shorter versions of longer form Old Testament stories. There are shorter versions of longer form Old Testament stories. So you're seeing the same stories told over and over and over again in different ways, right? And this is how you program the subconscious mind, all right? So <clears throat> um, where are we? Uh, and the lamb was not able to uh, uh, bear them both dwell for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. Verse seven, and there was strife between the herdmen. I got that already. Verse eight, and Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife between us. Said that already. Verse nine, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes there you see up, okay, up and beheld all the plain of Jordan. Jordan means to flow down, okay? These are not physical places, family. Now, they, some of them map to physical places today, but if you look at the words, right, they have meaning in terms of the context of the story. So Jordan means to flow down, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is actually an allusion to pervert the chapters 18 and 19, right? This is an illusion. So you know that this story was not written chronologically because the only way to allude to something in the future is if you had full knowledge of the future in advance, right? This is not like the news where people are documenting the news every single day, right? If there's an allusion to the future destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which comes up in chapters 18 and 19. So that's just something to keep in mind, all right? Um, even as the garden of the Lord. Now, why would Lot be concerned in that the land was well watered? If Lot represents the body consciousness, why would Lot be concerned? Why would Lot be concerned? The body is made up of what? What percentage of the body is water? 60 to 70 percent of the body is water. 60 to 70 percent of the body, our physical body, is water. So, Lot representing body consciousness knows that wherever it goes has to be well watered for the body to survive. <laughs> okay? So, even as the garden, all right? And here's, a, here's an image. Here's an image you can see. So uh, this is different ways of dividing up the body. So fat mass is 15 to 25%. Fat-free mass is 75 to 85. In three compartments, it's fat mass is 15 to 25%. Body water, 60%. Protein and minerals, 20%. Four compartments, fat mass is 15 to 25%. Body water is 60%. Then we have 15% protein and 5% uh, minerals, all right? So, so this is... Uh, 
um, you were just looking at ways that some of these stories actually map to the actual body. All right. So moving on, well watered uh, like the garden of the Lord. So I think we're talking, to, he's talking about the garden of Eden when he says garden of the Lord, um, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest into Zoar. All right. So so uh, Zoar means place to refuge, smallness, and sanctuary. We talked about that in uh, Genesis when we decoded Genesis 18 and 19. All right. So <clears throat> moving forward, verse 11. And Lot, uh, Lot chose him all the plains of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom, okay? So this is where we see Lot is moving towards Sodom. We know that sodomize in the English language means to go against uh, nature or go against God, right? So Sodom is not a physical place. It is a allegorical place used to talk about when we within go against our nature, right? Our spiritual nature, when we go against our spiritual nature or go against God. People have used it to talk about uh, homosexuality. I don't think that's what it's meant to discuss. It is talking about the part of ourselves that goes against our true nature and our God. Some of us go to work every single day on the corporate plantation and we're going against our true nature. I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise their hands, right? But when you get in that car to go to that job you hate, you are going against your true nature. You know you were called to do something else. You are in Sodom and Gomorrah. And how do you know you're in Sodom and Gomorrah? Because when you finally are ready to depart because, or you get dismissed from that job, what do they call it? Sodom means flaming and burnt. Sodom means flaming and burnt. And when you get so out of touch on that job, what, what happens, y'all? You get fired from your job. You get fired from your job. And it's a good thing because you are going against your nature. You getting fired from your job is a good thing because you were likely going against your nature. Have you ever seen somebody with the exception of Steve Jobs? <laughs> That's funny, his name is Jobs, right? With the exception of Steve Jobs, have you ever seen somebody get fired from a job they love? You ever seen somebody get fired from a job they love? I haven't heard not one story with the exception of Steve Jobs getting fired from a job they love. Okay, so when you are doing work that you hate, you are in Sodom and Gomorrah. You're going against your nature. You're going against God. You're going against your purpose. I hope y'all hearing me. I hope y'all hearing me. Because you, you can only fake it for so long without losing yourself. You can lose yourself and then fit into their paradigm. You can lose yourself. 20 years later, you realize I'm still here. This was not the plan. You don't even know yourself anymore because you conform. See, most employers, they see you as a ball of talent and clay that they can mold into whatever they desire. Nobody's going to ask you, what is it that you want to do here? What is it that you want to create? What is it that you want to build as an entrepreneur? Nobody's going to ask you that. They're going to mold you into whatever they want you. I mean, yeah, we need you to go move your family uh, out to Boise, Idaho. We need you to pick up and ship, like literally will do whatever you allow. See, some of y'all are mad at your employers, but you, somebody can only do to you what you allow them to do to you. Some of them, they can only do to you what you allow them to do to you. If you're not happy, then move on. Oh, but Julian, I got kids. I got a mortgage, this and that then you don't know your value. You don't know your worth. You don't know who you are. Because why would God give you a purpose and then not give you everything that you need to succeed at that purpose? You don't have enough faith. Now I'm not asking you to just go quit your job tomorrow with no game plan, no. You gotta build the bridge. You gotta start doing the work now for that transition. But I got a secret for y'all. And I didn't even mean to speak on this. I got a secret for y'all. When you're ready to leave your job, do not let your performance go down to the bottom. 
you should actually, if you're ready to leave, you should actually do something amazing for your employer because you want to leave at your peak, not at your trough. Some of y'all get ready to leave when your energy level and your performance is down in the gutter. You actually, if you're truly trying to leave, you want to do something amazing for them so that you can then use that narrative in your interviews for your next transition. Y'all not hearing me though. Oops, why does it keep doing that? Going against your nature. Man, that was a sermon in itself. <laughs> okay, cool. So, but the, the men of Sodom were wicked and the sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now. You see, lift up, lift up, right? You see that right there in verse 14. Again, lift up, down. Jordan means flowing down. This is like ups and downs. Of, this, is, this is the ups and downs of our spiritual journey. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward, and eastward and westward. For the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. Okay? So listen. Listen. This is a verse about manifestation. This is a verse about manifestation. You have to see it before you can have it. You have to visualize everything that you desire before you can possess it. You have to project it before you possess it. You have to project it before you possess it. You have to see it in your mind and grasp it there first before you can grasp it in your hand. So you have to go up to the highest place in your conscious thought and your awareness, hopefully to the superconscious, where you're now thinking in oneness with God so that you can see everything that is truly yours. And now once you've seen it from a helicopter or bird's eye view, then you can go obtain it. But you have to lift up first. You cannot obtain more from where you are currently at. Where you are currently at has allowed you to grasp what you have. If you want to grasp more, you have to elevate. Okay? <clears throat> so this is about vision. And so this is where some of the things of vision board come from, right? Now, verse 15, for all of the land which thou seest to thee will I give, give it into thy seed forever, all right? Verse 16, this is key, and this is why I highlighted it. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. What was Adam made from, supposedly? What was Adam made from? Adam was supposedly made from dust, right? So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now, verse 17, arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Now, this is a lot of land. You think Abram walked that land by a rise and walk? Do you have to actually physically move to walk? Everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes right now. I want you to walk through your house right now. Go. From wherever you're sitting, I want you to walk to the refrigerator and back. Just do it. Close your eyes. Don't move your legs. Just walk to the refrigerator and back. I'll give you 10 seconds. Go grab you something to eat, get a snack, get some water, and then come back. Okay, everybody back? Done. Andrea said, I only needed two seconds. You can go there faster in your mind and you can't go there physically, family. You can go there in your mind faster. There's no time in your mind. There's no time in your mind. You can teleport places in your mind. You are not limited by the body. You are not limited by time. 
You're not limited by other people's words and beliefs. You're not limited by resources. There are no limitations in your mind except the ones you put on it. Wow. There is no time in mind. See, so, you know, I take my notes and I do my studies prior to here, but then when I'm here in your presence, whenever two or more are gathered, when I'm in your presence, <laughs> new things come out. <laughs> new things come out. So I'm grateful and thank you for holding space for me. All right. So um, verse 18, and Abram removed his tent, right? And tent typically means uh, a temporary state of consciousness. Tent usually means a temporary state of consciousness. House means like I dwell there. That's my address. Like my default address is joy. Everybody tell me your default address. The default house that I dwell in, my being, my default is joy. Everybody, tell me what your default address is emotionally, vibrationally. What is your default address? What is your default address? Love, peace, contentment. That's your default address. That's the house that you dwell in. Now, temporarily, you'll take up a tent in sadness, in grief, in unforgiveness. True or false? Will we temporarily take up a tent in another place? Yeah. Yeah will temporarily take up a tent, but that is not our permanent residence. That's not our default. These are states of consciousness, family, not physical locations. So always know what your default is, who you are in, in your ideal state and in your normal state. But then as we go through life and we go through the ups and the downs, we take up tents. We dwell in um, some regret for two days. We go dwell in some unforgiveness for a few days. We go dwell in anger for half a day. But then we always must go back home to where our house is, where our spirit truly dwells. That place never leaves. It's permanent. It's permanent. But some of us make some of our tents our new residence. Some of us make our tents into our residences. You think that that you you gonna start a mail forwarding? That's your new address now. That's not how that's not how God made you. How does God see you? How does God see you? You have this lower perception of yourself. Other people have lower perception of you. How does God see you? That is your true address. Because my father's house has many rooms, and when I dwell in my father's house, I'm in peace. I'm in joy. I'm in happiness. That's my address. But again. Sometimes we leave the father's house, just like the prodigal son, and we go take up tent somewhere else. But it's the tent because it's temporary unless we make it permanent. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre. We know that Mamre sounds like what? Mamre sounds like what? Mamre gland. And what does it mean? Memory means from seeing adversity, from being well-fed, right? The planet memory, which is in Hebron, Hebron to talk, to be dark, place of joining, um, perhaps the alliance with Lot, perhaps that's an allusion to the alliance that he's going, that he has with Lot and built there an altar unto the Lord, okay? Whoo! Chapter 13, okay? Y ready for 14? Y'all ready for 14? I know this is a lot. Three chapters. Uh, we typically don't, we've never done three chapters before, but uh, we're moving and, um, and I feel blessed and my energy is good. So let's go. All right, Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> now, I had difficulty in Genesis chapter 14. I did my decoding of all the uh, king's names and things of that nature. I'm trying to understand what is the significance of Genesis chapter 14. It is not clear to me at this time. OK, um, but maybe it got revealed to some of you. Maybe it got revealed to some of you what this all means. It is not clear why this war started, who is fighting who, who's taking whose side. It is not clear who has what land, but we're going to go through it anyways. Um, and when we get to when we get to um, 
chapters like this, I don't want us to give up. It's like leg day is hard at the gym, but that doesn't mean we should skip it. All right. So this is a, this one was a difficult chapter. I wasn't able to, uh, I've yet, let me, let me clear my language up. I was yet to see the significance of why these words would be here. Why would somebody write this? What is the importance of this? I know it's not just words on a page. It means something, but what and why? All right. So we are going to go through it anyways. And that's part of this process. The tough parts, we're going to go through them anyways. Okay. Because it may come back around when we're in Exodus that now something in Exodus makes Genesis chapter 14 make sense. Right. So, but if we skip it, then we won't be able to make that connection when it would come across it in the future. When we hear um, Melchizedek's, um, Melchizedek's um, name again. Right. Oh, then now I understand why this was. Okay. So we don't want to skip these things. So uh, let's go through it. And it came to pass in the days of Am Raphael. Okay, we see L there again. Um, Am Raphael uh, means, oh, that means to Am Raphael. I got my line there. I think it's pointing to the, oh yeah. Oh, uh, it's to, to talk or to be dark. Hebron means place of joining. Okay, so excuse me. So. Am Raphael means to talk or to be dark. King of Shinar. Shinar means to cast out a breach or a city of wit. Okay. Um, Arioch, which means hidden. King of Elasar, which means rebellious God. Rebellious God onto rebellion. Um, Ched, Cheddar Loa Amor. They could, I could not find any um, translation of that or any understanding of that. King of Elam, which also Elam means uh, no Elam means hidden. Um, does anybody have Arioch? <laughs> Did anybody get Arioch? What does Arioch mean? Arioch given over to lust. Thank you. Given over to lust. Oh, it means dominion or lion like. Thank you. Means dominion. Dominion. Or lion like. All right. And title, uh, which is to praise uh, that breaks the yoke, knowledge of elevation, king of the nations. That these made war with Bera. And Bera means son of evil or in evil. King of Sodom, and we know what Sodom means, and Bersha, uh, Ber which is son of wickedness or uh, with wickedness, right? Um, King of Gomorrah, we already decoded Gomorrah, and Shinab, which is father of change, father has turned. King of Ad Adma, we know Adma or Adam, uh, similar to Adam means red ground or earth, and Shimber, uh, which means renown of protector or known for being strong, king of Zeboim, which means collective, uh, collective gazelles, and king of Bela, swallow up or uh, down destruction, which is in Zoar, which means place of smallness or security, right? Verse three, all of these were joined together in the veil of Sidom, or Sidom, which means to plow, to act violently, furrows, division, fields, and demons which is the salt sea, okay? So that was, this was a lot. It took time just to go through those three verses. Now, for, for uh, says 12 years, they serve Chedor, Chedor Laomer, Laomer um, and in the 13th year, they rebelled. So they were serving this one king and then they rebelled in the 13th year and in the 14th year came Chedor La, La Omer and the king that were with him and smote the Rephams and the Ashtaroth and the Karnaim, Karnaims and the Zuzims, Zuzims in Ham and the Imims in Shaveh and Kiriathiam. Okay. <clears throat> and the Horites and their Mount Seir 
unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And verse seven, they returned and came into En Misfat, which is in Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalek, Amal, uh, Amalekites, uh, and also the Amorites, and dwelt in Hazazon, uh, Tamar, and there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Ad, Adma, and the king of Zeb, Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same is Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the Vale of Sidon, with Chedor, <coughs> Chedor Laomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphael, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elasar, four kings with five. And the veil of Sodom was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountains. And they took all, all the uh, goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom in, uh, and his goods and departed. And there came one that it, it escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, uh, the Amorite, brother of Eskol, Eskol means cluster of grapes, and brother of Anar, and these were conf uh, confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, okay, right? So these are basically his disciples, his disciples. Your trained servants born in your own mind, or your disciplined thoughts, okay? So your trained servants are your disciplined thoughts. Disciplined thoughts, okay? Or disciples, all right? And born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. So 318, if you add up all those numbers, that equals 12, all right? So you start to see some numerology here. Um, 15, he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night and smote them and pursued them unto uh, Hoba, Hoba, which means hiding place, which is on the left hand of Damascus, right? Um, Damascus means the beginning of salvation or synchronicity. And he brought back all the goods and all also brought, again, his brother Lot and his goods and the woman also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Cheddar Lamor of, um, of the kings that were with him in the valley of Sheve, plain or to be level with equally, which is the Kingsdale. And Melchizedek, Melchizedek, king of Salem. So Melchizedek means my king is Sedek or my king is just and righteous. And Salem means peace and perfect. So this is uh, basically the <laughs> king of perfect peace, um, brought forth bread and wine. And where else do you, where else do you hear a, a king of perfect peace? A just king of perfect peace. Where else do you hear that? A just king of perfect peace. Where do you see that? Who did I remind you of? Jesus. Jesus illusion. Okay. And 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 what did Jesus break with his uh, his disciples, family? What did Jesus break with his disciples? Bread and wine. You see how these same stories at Last Supper. See how these stories again are playing over and over and over again, just different characters. Y'all seeing this? Okay. So listen, it's right here. And then Melchizedek. King of Salem, Melchizedek, my king is just or righteous. King of Salem, which is peace, peace or perfect, perfect peace, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. Sound like the Last Supper right here. Okay, so verse 19, verse 19, and he blessed them and he said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Now, this is the first mention of tithes. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I broke down um, 
the real meaning of tithes and where it came from, this is the first mention of tithes. So the question is, where did Abram get this custom? How did Abram know that? How did even Abram know this Mel, uh, King Melchizedek? Melchizedek, how did he know him? And why would he just give him tithes like that, right? So these are the things that come up. And then the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods uh, to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord and uh, the most of the most high God, possessor of heaven. Okay. Uh, and earth that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shalt say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me Anar, Eskel, and Mamre, and let them take their portion. This is powerful. This is powerful. You know what this is saying, right? Don't take anything that is against God, or else it will act as if it's your source of wealth. Don't take anything that is against God. Sodom means against God. So don't take anything that is not of God because then it will act as if it is your source of wealth. Some of you call your job, back to your jobs. I don't know why this is coming up for me today. Some of you call your jobs your income source. Your job is not your income source. Your employer is not your income source. Your job is an income stream. Your source is always God. Some of you have made your bosses your employers, your God. That's not your income source. It is an income stream that you have, but your true source is always God because how did you get the job in the first place? How did you meet that person at the coffee shop that ended up landing you the interview that ended up landing you the job? Who orchestrated all of that? The most high. The most high. Who gave you the talents? Who got you into that school? Who helped you pass that test when you <laughs> didn't study as hard as you needed to? <laughs> Never mistake a stream with the source, family. Never mistake a stream with the source. The source is always higher than the stream. The source is always higher than the stream, OK? And so why didn't Abram want anything? Because Abram represents our spiritual self, correct? The soul craves nothing more of the material world except enough to be here. This is what I got from this. The soul, Abram, our spiritual self, craves nothing more from the material world except the body healthy enough to be present here, to have the experience. It doesn't want anything else. Why? Because it can't take it with it. It didn't come with it, and it knows it won't leave with it. It didn't come with it, and it knows it won't leave with it. So the true soul and spirit craves nothing material, okay? This is what it means to be in the world, but not of it. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. I'm in the world, but I am not of the world. I don't measure my success by my material accumulation. I don't. Am I grateful for the material accumulation that I've been able to have? Yeah, but guess what? I'm always trying to circulate the accumulation that I have. I'm trying to circulate, not accumulate. I'm trying to stir this whole pot up. I don't care how much I leave with, because guess what? Everybody leaves with zero. If I can give my daughter a head start by leaving her with something, great, I'm gonna do that. Only so that she can have a deeper, richer spiritual experience of this world without materials being the driver without people looking at money and saying, in God I trust and making money their God, okay? So this is what it means to be in the world, but not of it, okay? Spirit is the great substance. But what happens is the veil, which is lot, is the illusion of material substance. Spirit is the true substance. It is the etheric substance that makes up all the world. 
but we've been duped into this illusion of material substance. And Abram in this particular instance is saying, I don't want any of the material things. I know what the true substance behind all of that is. And I already am that. So I don't need that because then you will use that against me as if you are my source of wealth. No, you are a stream. Here, take everything that you belongs to you that you want, take everything that belongs to you, only give me enough to eat. Only give me enough to preserve the physical body so that I can continue to have this experience. You don't really have that many needs, family. You don't really have that many needs. Your spirit, your true you, your spirit doesn't have that many needs. I know you got a whole bunch of things on your vision board. I want this, I need this, I need that, I need this. Your spirit doesn't have that many needs. It needs breath, it needs a body, it needs some food periodically, and it needs purpose. It needs to do what it came here to do. Anything else? is exorbitant. Anything else is just extra. You don't have as many needs as you think, the true you. Your spirit isn't moved by advertisements. Your spirit isn't moved by brand names. Your spirit isn't moved by accumulation or having things that other people don't have. That's not what moves your spirit. That's not what fulfills your spirit. Material substance, when approached in the wrong way, can take you off your path. Okay? The greatest substance of all is spirit. It is a substance that we can't see. Why? Because we are it. It's like asking a fish, what is water? Fish couldn't tell you what water is. This is, what? What do you mean, what is water? I'm just in it. I am it. <clears throat> okay? Y'all with me? That's two chapters in one session. Deep breath. I'm going to go into 15. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit y'all with something. I'm going to hit y'all with something. Y'all going to be like, what? All right, let's go into chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. Pause. People call the Bible the word of God. That's what people call the Bible, right? Have you, how many of you heard people call the Bible the word of God? But right here it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came. Before the Bible was written, the word of the Lord was. So then you know that the Bible is not the word of God or the only word of God. The Bible is not the only word of God. How many of you heard God this week? How many of you hearing God right now? How many of you are hearing God right now in this moment? Word of God is endless family. And guess what? It didn't even come to Abram as words. It came to Abram as what? It came to Abram as a vision. God operates in images. Why do you think, why do you think uh, the Egyptians wrote hieroglyphs, family? These were images. God speaks in visions and images. Let us make man in our own what? In our own image. A picture speaks what? A thousand what? A picture speaks a thousand what? Words. So we are calling forth visions, <laughs> images. It's hard to mistake an image. If somebody says, uh, I want you to make a, if somebody says, I want you to make me a cake, there's many different interpretations of a cake, right? But if somebody sends you an image of what they want, they're likely going to get 
a lot closer to what they truly desire. <laughs> so an image speaks. And in this case, Abram heard the word of God in a vision, got it as a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. <clears throat> okay. So, and Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me seeing I go childless and steward of my house is, uh, and the steward of my house is Ele Eleazar of Damascus. Okay. Eleazar means uh, God uh, is help. All right. Now, Abram somehow has slipped into body consciousness because now Abram is looking for an earthly reward when God is the plug. Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. But Abram responds with doubt and is looking for some material confirmation that God is going to do what it says it's going to do. Right? And the material confirmation that Abram wants is child. Right? Now, Three, Abram said, behold, to me, thou hast given no seed and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, this shall not be thine heir, but thou hast shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. Verse four again, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. You know what this says, family? Your greatest rewards will come out of you. Your greatest rewards in life will come out of you. They won't come from an accolade. They won't come from the Grammys. They won't come from any stage. It won't be a trophy. It won't be a medal. It won't come from your parents. It won't come from your employer. It won't come from your community. Your greatest rewards in life will come out of you. It won't come from a husband. It won't come from a wife. The greatest rewards that you have in life that you receive will come out of you. I hope y'all heard that, y'all. You looking for rewards and plaques to put up on your wall given to you by other people affirming what you've accomplished in the world. Your greatest rewards will come out of you. They won't come from anywhere else. They will come through you. It won't be a college degree. It won't be a PhD. It won't be a first place prize here. It won't be a raise there. Your greatest rewards in life will come through you. They will come out of you, your own bowels. And I'm not just talking a child, I'm talking thought seeds, ideas that you bring forth, heavenly ideas that you bring forth into this earthly realm. Stop looking outward for rewards. Stop people pleasing. Stop looking for other people to approve you. You are already approved. You are already chosen. You are already chosen. Who else going to choose you? Who else can choose you greater than God? You already, you already a chosen child. What, why are you still looking to get chose? You're already chosen. Verse five. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now towards heaven right? Look now towards heaven. We're looking up. We're elevating to the highest frequency. That's what heaven is, the highest frequency possible, right? And tell the stars, if thou be, if thou be able to number them, and he said unto them, so shall thy seed be. Y'all ready for this? I need everybody to take their seatbelts and just buckle up real quick. Everybody go ahead, grab your seatbelt right now and buckle up. Buckle up. Y'all ready? In Genesis 14, 16, what did it say? In Genesis 14, 16, it said, 
and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if man can number the dust of the earth, then uh, thy seed shall also be numbered, right? So here, Genesis 14, 16, we have dust. Now, we come here and it says, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, and he said unto them, so shall thy seed be. <clears throat> so now we have stars. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? What is the human body made up of? Dust plus stars equals what, family? Dust plus stars equals what? Stardust. And what are the human body made up of? Planetary scientist and stardust expert, Dr. Ashley King explains, is totally 100% true. Nearly all the elements of the human body were made in a star and many have come through several supernovas. What are you made up of? Most of the elements that make up the human body were formed in stars, all the way from oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, uh, what is that, uh, nitrogen. I don't know why that image came in so blurry. 90% um, of our body mass is in fact stardust. 90% of our body mass is stardust because all the elements except for hydrogen and helium are created in stars. You think that's a coincidence that in Genesis 14, 16 said count the dust and then Genesis 15 and five says count the stars. And then it just so happens that 90% of our body is made up of stardust. That, that's, just, that's just a coincidence. Didn't say number of blades of grass. Didn't say number of, uh, number of omers of flour. Didn't say that to count the dust and count the stars. When I put star and dust together, I get stardust. And it just so happens that 90% of our body is made up of the same elements of stardust. This is why we had to go back. Again, these stories keep mapping back to our body and our mind. The Bible is a manual to help us understand how to our spirit can harness and use our mind and our body for our spiritual evolution. Spirit controls the mind. The mind is supposed to control the body. When the body is in control, that's physical illness. When the mind is in control, that's mental illness. Mental dis-ease, physical dis-ease. We're trying to get back to the right hierarchy. Spirit, mind, body. And we're trying to have them operate as one. Where our flesh is not at war with our spirit. Where our flesh is not at war with our mind. Because now when we look at these wars amongst the kings, and we look at some of the names of the kings and what they mean, Hidden, cast out, city of wit, <laughs> dominion, son of evil, wickedness, uh, attacking force, um, uh, to act violently, furrows, uh, swallow up or down, destruction, um, to break the yoke, etc. This sounds like inner warfare to me. Rebellious. This sounds like inner warfare between the flesh, the spirit, and the mind. That's what it really sounds like to me, because these wars just come up out of nowhere. But these are the wars that we are fighting internally every single day. They call it spiritual warfare. That's what we're engaged in every single day. But I don't. But a lot of people say spiritual warfare and they talk about some devil outside of themselves. But devil spelled backwards is the word lived. So when you're living your life backwards, that's when you experience the devil. The devil is not an external entity trying to dupe you. The devil is our house divided and the side not living in alignment. That is sodomized. That is going against God. That is the devil. It's no dude with a pitchfork, pitchfork and the fiery bowels of the earth. No, it's not. Sorry. Ain't buying that one. There's nothing against you. Because scripture says all things are working together for what? All things are working together for what? 
my good. So there's nothing against me. Yeah, then scripture also does say, if God be for me, who can be against me? Nobody. Who created a dichotomy where God has opposition? God is the most powerful, the most high. How could God have opposition? We can be out of alignment, but God has no opposition. There's no equal opposite force for God. There is duality as we explored in Genesis one, there's duality in this realm, but there's no power that is equal and opposite to God. God is it all. We just don't perceive it correctly. You know that some forest fires are natural. Forest fires are a natural part of the regeneration of forest. But from our eyes, we look at it as that's destruction. That's evil. That's bad. No, it's a natural part of forest preservation. So we just don't understand what, when we don't understand how God operates, we call things that occur that don't look um, positive. We call them evil. We call them negative. We call them bad. God is all. God is omnipresent. So if God is omnipresent, then where, where is there room for any other entity? If God is omnipresent, where is there room for any other entity? Omnipresent means everywhere. Omnipresent means everywhere. Does, and does omnipresent mean 99% of the places? Does omnipresent mean 99% of all the places? Does omnipresent mean 98% of all? Does not, omnipresent mean 99.9% .9 of all the places, but there's just one little place? No, omnipresent means everywhere. So if God is everywhere and God is all, then where is there room for an equal opposing entity or energy? It's all God. Life is God. Death is God. Wealth is God. God says, the scripture says, God giveth wealth. And poverty is God. It is all part of the human experience. Happiness is God. Sadness is God. It's all God. But we've been taught to create a line of division that says this is of God and this is not. That's when you start to move into religion. This is, this is right and this is wrong. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, biting of the apple, the sweetness of the apple thinking that you know what is right and what's wrong. That's what the biting of the apple is. You thinking you know what is right and what's wrong. We don't. We don't. Because we can only see from our limited human perspective. The difference between us and God, the only difference is magnitude. We do our best to have a God's eye view. That's what we're elevating in our spiritual growth and evolution, to try to have a God's eye view of this thing called life. But even then, when we elevate, <coughs> we're still limited. Okay? So... Let's wrap up. 18. And Abram removed, uh, oops. Excuse me. We're on chapter 15, uh, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Er means flame or light. Um, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So Abram's still looking for uh, a, a material, a material confirmation, right? <laughs> a breadcrumb. And he said uh, uh, in verse nine, and he said unto him, take me a heifer, which is a young female cow of three years old and a she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon, right? And he took them uh, unto him, all these, and divided them in the midst. 
and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. Now, if you remember back from our earlier study, fowls represent heaven and sky, which is the super conscious thoughts. Beasts represent conscious thoughts, which is the uh, upper earth or the ground. And then fish represent the subconscious thoughts, which is the lower earth or sea and water. Okay. And man comes from the dust, the conscious thought or mind. All right. And when the fowls came down the car, uh, upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. I'm still trying to break down what that might mean. And when the sun was gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Who else got put to deep sleep, family? Who else got put to deep sleep? Ah, uh, y'all starting to see patterns now. Adam and Noah and Abram. Why? Why did all these patriarchs have to get put to deep sleep? Because sometimes the conscious mind is what's blocking your manifestation. Some of you will manifest better asleep than you will awake because the conscious mind uses the five senses. The conscious mind looks at your bank account and says, I don't have enough money to do this. The conscious mind looks at the news and says, oh, people say I can't buy a house right now. Interest rates are going up. The conscious mind looks at your generational curses and said, nobody in my family has done this before. So sometimes the conscious mind has to be put to sleep so that the subconscious mind can actually go do its work. The superconscious, which is God consciousness, has to bypass the conscious mind because the conscious mind has too many limitations in it. This is why in these cases, these men were put to sleep. They were put to sleep so they could stop thinking about what, because all you hear in here is Abram with doubt. As Abram is stepping into the body consciousness, Abram has doubt. Just show me a material sign, God. How do I know? Please just let me know. That's doubt. That's a spirit of doubt. God said, all right, cool. Super conscious. I'm a, we're going to bypass the conscious mind. Put that, put that dude to sleep. Ready to go night-night? Night-night. We're just going to go, we're going to go straight through the work. Okay? We can't get through his conscious mind. We're going to go straight to the work. Okay? Bye. Right, night-night. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now, for a long time, <laughs> I thought that this was uh, the stories of uh, Africans in America. 400 years, the timing was right on par. I think we just passed that in 2021 or something like that. 400 years. I thought that that was our story. Right. But again, I got to go back to allegory. And what I'm recognizing is that 400 is nothing particular happened in the 400th year, okay? So what I'm starting to realize uh, is that this is spiritual. This is a story of our spiritual self having a human experience. And we are in this world, but not of it. We have been, uh, our spiritual selves have been afflicted in this land of materiality, right? And we have been serving the material. For too long, we've been serving the material. Money has become our God. 13 of Jesus' 39 parables are about money. We've been serving, the spirit has been serving materiality and measuring success based on materiality, right? So for verse 14, and also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge it. And afterwards, shall they come out with great substance. So this journey from soul into body is meant to enrich our soul. We are meant to come here to get richer from a soul standpoint, not just richer materially, but our soul should be richer in this generation of life. Our soul should gain more wisdom. Our soul should be more fulfilled. We should be enriched by this journey, not depleted, okay? Substantially and subconsciously. In verse 15, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in good, uh, good old age. Verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land 
from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, right? Euphrates means to be uh, fruitful. Egypt means double siege or distress or to bind. And the Canaanites and the Canaanites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphians and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. So what I see here is primitive and pre-modern East, uh, hunter and trapper, terror, terrible, talkers, rural, wildling, dwellers in clay soil, take and stroke, uh, and then of trodden underfoot, the down tramplers, and to be brought down by the heavy load or subdue, humble, and merchant. Okay. So, so I'm going to conclude with this. There are four stages of reprogramming our mind, right? And the first one is program, knowing that. So all these things down here, all these quote unquote people, they, this is very negative, right? Very negative things. So listen to me very carefully. The, in order to de reprogram your mind, first, you have to recognize that there's a program. Something negative is occupying the land. Something negative, a group, a cluster of thoughts, negative thinking is occupying the land. You have to be aware of that first, okay? Two, you have to remove them from the land. Land being the conscious mind. Three, you plant new seeds, right? And this is what keeps on saying, right? I'm gonna get your, thy seed, thy seed, thy seed. What does seed mean, family? What does seed mean? What does seed equate to? If you think about the parable of the sower, what does seed equate to? Seed is thought. Thy seed is not just another human being. It's not just physical children. It is thought. So when you reprogram, you now are planting new seeds and letting them take root in the land, in the conscious and subconscious mind. And then four, you run the program, which is you water the seeds with your thought streams. And this is why it says from the rivers of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, which means to be fruitful. You water these seeds with your streams of consciousness, your thought streams, okay? And allow them to multiply and bear good fruit, which, which then has, what does fruit have in it? With the exception of these fake watermelons out in these streets, what does fruit have in it? It has more seeds. True fruit has more seed in it. That is Genesis 15, family. Woo, we covered a lot. <laughs> we covered a lot. How y'all feeling? I feel great. I feel blessed. I feel used. I feel aligned. I feel at one mint. I feel purpose driven. I feel whole. I feel childlike. I feel excited. I feel eager. I feel close to God. Everybody just take a deep breath. In heaven, exhale. We covered a lot. We covered a lot. I hope you were able to catch some of the gems that I discovered. But I, more, more importantly, I hope you were able to catch your own gems, get your own divine downloads throughout this process. Ultimately, I don't want you to ever be dependent on me. I'll hold the space, but it's really about your self-discipline or your self-discipleship that will get you to the space of spiritual growth that you desire. Um, this has been a blessing. These were chapters that I thought had nothing in them, but upon second glance, third glance, fourth glance, I realized that there was so much depth. We are made of stardust. This is the connection of this particular story to the body that we are 
never meant to seek material material confirmation we're spiritual beings having a human experience that we as spiritual beings don't have that many needs and we're not going to let anybody in the material realm or anything in the material realm convince us of any material metric of success we know that those things will come as we are moving in our spiritual purpose but that's not what we're seeking and that's not what we're here for abram this exalted father this exalted spirit is trying to come into oneness with the body and at first lot the veil the body conscious has to separate like i tried i've tried to integrate and be share space and i couldn't but at some point at some point we're going to have to learn to make our spirit our mind and our body operate as one that they aren't separate that one isn't evil because the church has demonized the flesh no i'm grateful for my flesh without the flesh i could not have this experience I keep demonizing the flesh, then guess what? That which you resist persists. I have to learn how to subdue it, how to lead it, how to be one with it, how to train it. Like Abram trained his trained servants, I have to train it to and preserve the hierarchy, but not use the hierarchy as a um, higher than you and therefore you have to do this. No, not that kind of command but just more harmony, not a heavy handed type of leadership, just harmony between mind, body, and spirit, All right? So with that, I love y'all. I appreciate you for being here. I appreciate you for having the courage to go on this journey. Many people just want to stay living in their illusion, looking at the surface level versions of these stories and taking them as truth, going and praying in actual physical closets instead of going into the closet of their mind. So I'm grateful for each of you. Um, yeah, this is courageous to ask questions about God. That's courageous. I know many of you can't go to your spiritual places and ask these questions. That's when they start to push you away because they don't have the answers. The answers are not outside of you. They're within you. So, um, Thank you for being you. Thank you for going on this journey with me. And we're going to keep on elevating. So with that homework is chapters 16 and 17. That will catch us up since we've already done 18 and 19. So homework is to read and decode Genesis chapter 16 and 17. Read it, read it and decode it three times before next Sunday. Uh, you are not meant to come to this space. And for those of you who are first timers, uh, you're not meant to come to this space, space and just show up. You have to, this is uh, proactive spirituality, not passive spirituality. You have to be the active participant. You're not here to just come get my cliff notes. You are meant to study to show thyself approved. So you have to study prior to coming here. And study means reading and decoding Genesis chapter 16 and 17 to the best of your ability between now and next Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For those of you on social media, go to jointruthseekers.com. Go to jointruthseekers.com. Uh, do that right now. That will give you access to our uh, past recordings and to our Facebook group where we continue the conversation throughout the week. Again, that's jointruthseekers, with an S, .com. Go over there now and join us. The link is also in my bio. And, uh, um, and for everybody who's in Zoom already, go over to the Facebook group and just tell me what was your greatest takeaway from today. Just take a moment, just take 60 seconds right now to hop over to Zoom as soon as I close this out um, and uh, let me know what was your greatest takeaway and greatest insight from today. All right, love y'all. Catch you next week, Genesis chapter 16 and 17. Peace.